So hello, I would like to say good day, everyone. Dobre uh, and Wan, Wan Shao Hao, um, to everyone, and especially to um, the guests from RASBJ, um, our Yale Center Beijing guests, and of course, um, Philip Snow, our distinguished speaker. Um, welcome to today's event on China and Russia in 10 turning points. I, I can't hear, wait to hear story, about the story a behind A story it. in 10 turning points. A story in 10 turning points, um, which is co-organized by RESBJ and Yale Center Beijing, and also part of the Yale University Press and Yale Center Beijing Find Your Next Great Read series. Um, my name is Carol Lee Rafferty. I am the executive director of Yale Center Beijing and a Yale College alumna. For those of you who may be new to the center, um, Yale Center Beijing is Yale University's only university-wide center outside of its US, US campus representing all 14 schools. So throughout the year, we host events such as these, convening thought leaders from all sectors um, globally um, to discuss the most important and interesting topics facing our world. Um, and today, um, well, first of all, history is very near to dear to my heart, as well as Yale University's, because Yale University is fortunate um, to be uh, to have faculty part of part of their faculty as part of their faculty, um, preeminent historians ranging from um, the late Jonathan Spence to um, South Asian history expert Sunil Amrith, with whom we have the pleasure of co-hosting. Um, with RASBJ um, late last year. Um, so today it is um, an honor and a pleasure to be hosting historian and author Philip Snow to talk about his new book, which is uh, published by the Yale University Press. Um, I would also like to say that I'm very grateful for our friendship with the RASBJ um, and especially to Melinda, Alan, um, and the wonderful RASBJ and YCB team for this collaboration. I myself am a proud member of RASBJ. And um, in these challenging times, um, I think we can really do more um, of these talks that provide context um, to um, the many issues and conversations that were happening um, in today's world. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I would um, very much like to welcome Alan Babington Smith, the founding president of RASBJ, as well as our speaker, Philip Snow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol, for a lovely introduction. And I would like to, in turn, thank you, Carol, and the team, especially Xin Jing here at the Yale Center for making this possible. It's wonderful to see a full room from both RASBJ and Friends of Yale. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to be the moderator, which means that I basically introduce the speaker and will help field the questions and thank him at the end. And my only qualification for that is that I have known Philip Snow for longer than most people in this room have been alive. Uh, our first engagement together, I think, not our, almost our first, was when we shared a bet about whether Deng Xiaoping would make a comeback. <laughs> that dates us. <laughs> Philip has been studying Russian and Chinese history in very directly in person and intellectually through books for most of his life. And so we're very lucky to have someone so well qualified to describe the tortuous path China-Russia relations have taken over the last 400 years. Uh, he's ready to take some questions afterwards. Um, and we're quite lucky, I think, that uh, we have this event after the meeting in Moscow, where so he won't be asked to predict what's going to happen now. So, Philip, please take us through 400 years of Russian history. <laughs> well, thank you, Alan, for your very kind words. And thank you, everyone, for coming here this evening. Uh, this talk will be on the record, by the way. I certainly hadn't expected to deliver this talk at a time of such topicality. And I'll turn my attention to contemporary matters a bit later on. Well, 
Shortly after I embarked on the in-depth research for this book, 15 years ago now, I was informed that there were over 1,200 works on Sino-Russian relations in the Library of Congress. A bit of a disincentive, you might suppose. But it also became clear to me that while there'd been a wealth of research into each segment of the 400-year encounter, relatively few attempts had been made to consider that period as a whole and to examine what shifts and continuities might shape the relationship. And this is what I've tried to do in my book. Fitting 400 years of history into a 45 minute talk is a rather tall order. I'll approach it this evening by looking at 10 major turning points in the Sino-Russian encounter. Though I'm well aware even then there'll still be an element to use the Chinese phrase of looking at flowers on horseback. Well, by the middle of the 17th century, two different sorts of Russians were groping their way into China. A series of trade and reconnaissance missions from the people the Chinese called Earl or Sir had arrived from the West, while bands of Cossack settlers who'd migrated across Siberia were marauding in the Amur River Valley on China's northeastern fringe. The Chinese called them Luo Cha, or flesh-eating demons. By the 1670s, it had become clear to Kang Xi, second emperor of the Manchu Qing dynasty, who'd conquered China in 1644, that the Er Luo Si and the Luo Cha were one and the same. And that consequently, China was confronted to its north and west by a formidable neighboring power. Tang Xi was determined to eliminate the marauders in the Northeast, which he did effectively by blockading and storming the Cossack outpost at Al Bazin in 1685 to 6. But Tang Xi was also conscious that the use of force was, as he put it, not a good thing, that if we advance and they retreat, and we retreat and they advance, there'll be no end to the conflict and the border peoples will not be in peace. And following a series of overtures, he brought the Russians to talks. Here then is our first turning point, the Treaty of Nerchinsk, concluded in August, September, 1689, an era of confrontation giving way in the 20th century cliche to an era of negotiation. Talks were undoubtedly helped along by a massive display of Qing military force. Al-Bazin was demolished and the Cossacks were obliged to withdraw from the Amur Valley. But the Qing too made remarkable concessions in addition to a right to trade. The first treaty negotiated by China with any European power on approximately equal terms. Talks held on the Amur frontier rather than in Beijing. Senior Qing representatives, all Manchus, not Chinese. Texts of the treaty in Manchu and Russian and Latin, but not in Chinese. All this seems to reflect a victory of what's been called the barbarian pragmatism of the new Manchu rulers of China over traditional Chinese protocol. The Qing also seem to have been prompted to close the deal by a recent development the upsurge of the Zungar Mongols under Galdan, a chieftain who sought to recreate the empire of Genghis Khan, and who posed a far more dangerous challenge to the Manchus' own empire building ambitions than a handful of Cossack pioneers. Galdan made a proposal of alliance to the Russians, which was rebuffed, an early example of a distinct tendency of the two great sedentary powers to join forces at the expense of the nomads or pastoralists in between. Nerchinsk paved the way for a long period of Sino-Russian equilibrium. The Russians secured trading rights, at first in Beijing, later concentrated on the Russo-Mongolian border post of Kyakta. The Qing succeeded in restraining the occasional Russian temptation to cut a deal with their Zungar enemies. In 1731-2, they even sent envoys to Moscow and St. Petersburg 
to assure themselves of Russian neutrality in a qing zungar war, the first two Chinese embassies ever sent to Europe. In 1757 to 64, however, that's our second turning point, the equilibrium took a shaking. In the words of a later Tsarist general, Russia and China had by now moved towards each other until they divided all the territory between them. Russia had received the submission of the greater and middle Kazakh hordes. The Qing had advanced into Qinghai and Tibet, annihilated the Zungars, and were poised to embark on the conquest of Tashkent and Samarkand. The stage was now set for a long series of Sino-Russian tussles in the border regions of Xinjiang, Mongolia, and Manchuria. By the early 1760s, Russia and China seemed again to be on the verge of conflict. Qing troops were patrolling to the Siberian frontier. Russian courtiers were suggesting a punitive expedition to regain the Amur. As in the run-up to Nerchinsk, however, moderation prevailed. Both sides appeared in awe of the other's potential strength. And the Russians in particular seemed afraid of getting drawn into conflict in the East at the same time that they were embroiled in conflict with Prussia in the course of the Seven Years' War. Following this crisis, equilibrium remained, but it was a changed equilibrium. With the Zungars annihilated, the Qing no longer needed to keep the Russians on side, while the Manchus, now increasingly sinicized, had lost their old barbarian pragmatism. Russian authorities were now addressed with traditional imperial haughtiness and border trade was suspended for years at a time. Russia, meanwhile, was growing steadily stronger in both economic and military terms. The Russians had also managed to establish in Beijing a formidable inside track through the activity of the Orthodox mission they first installed there in the early 18th century, ostensibly to assist to, to minister to the spiritual needs of the Russian traders unofficially to gather intelligence. Scruffy and dissolute in their early years, by the 1820s, the mission had won the respect of the Qing authorities, partly it seems for their lack of interest in evangelizing the locals. And some of their members had also won the admiration of the Qing elite through their medical skills and their talent for portrait painting. After the closure of the last Roman Catholic mission in China in 1825, the Russian priests were the only Europeans permitted to live in Beijing to the acute envy of Russia's Western European rivals. Well, from the mid 1840s, following the first opium war, the Russian priests in Beijing were reporting with alarm the influx of Western, especially British goods into China, and the danger this posed to Russia's trade at Kyakarta. Then in 1854 to 56, defeat in the Crimean War fueled a powerful Russian urge to seek compensation in the East. The result was that at our third turning point, 1854 to 60, Russia embarked on an expansionist policy, which left the Chinese on the defensive for many decades to come. From 1854, Count Nikolai Moraviov, Governor General of Eastern Siberia, was dispatching flotillas along the Amur to plant Russian settlers along the north bank of the river. An advance ratified and increased di diplomatically in the ensuing treaties of Aigun, Tianjin, and Beijing and which enabled Russia to detach from Qing rule the whole of what was sometimes known as Outer Manchuria, an area the size of France and Germany put together. This conquest was, however, quite bloodless, unlike the British and French assault on the Qing Empire in the same years. And it took what I would call an avuncular form. The Russians made a conspicuous show of goodwill to Beijing, offering to mediate for the Qing with the two Western powers, and even to provide them with arms and military training. After two centuries of interaction, they had a sensitivity to Chinese custom their Western counterparts lacked. In 
So Count Yefim Putyatin, the Tsarist negotiator at Tianjin, addressed the Qing representatives in the phraseology of the traditional tribute system. And at the close of the talks, he bestowed on them eight handsome presents apiece, unlike the British envoy who brought with him no gifts whatsoever. The Emperor Xianfeng and his advisors weren't wholly taken in by all this. All the barbarians, noted Prince Gung, have the nature of brute beasts. The British are the most unruly, but the Russians are the most cunning. After 200 years of exchanges, however, the Qing had nonetheless got used to the Russians on their land borders as part of the scenery, whereas the British and French look like extra extraterrestrials. And they even went so far as to take up the modern sounding Russian program of military aid until the British weighed in two years later with dire warnings of Russian designs. Under the culminating Treaty of Beijing in 1860, the Russians, along with the Western allies, won access for the first time to the Chinese interior. And over the following decades, they took advantage of the newfangled telegraph, steamships and railways to bring them up close to the neighboring empire as never before. Count Sergei Vita, the driving force behind the Trans-Siberian Railway, observed in the 1880s that Russian power in the East would increase as in proportion as the distance diminished. In 1880, Russia and China teetered once again on the verge of war over possession of the Yili Valley in Xinjiang. But once again, they pulled back. Tsarist officials in the foreign ministry were dismayed at the thought of the damage such a collision would inflict on our poor finances after the recent war with Turkey. And Chinese pugnacity was dispelled with the help of Britain's General Gordon, who summoned to advise the Grand Council, called for a Chinese dictionary and jabbed his finger at the word idiocy. Mm -hmm. Russia's Chinese policy remained avuncular. After Japan's attack on the Qing Empire in 1894-5, Count Vita, now Russia's Minister of Finance, concluded a secret treaty with the veteran Qing statesman Li Hongzhang, providing for a defensive alliance between the two countries. The quid pro quo was Qing consent to the building by the Russians of a Chinese Eastern Railway, representing a short cut through Manchuria, linking the Trans-Siberian Railway to the Pacific which would incidentally give Russian business a virtual monopoly of the local economy. Well, it was now, however, the high noon of imperialism. All the Western European powers and Japan were preparing to carve themselves territories out of China, whether in the form of leaseholds or outright, outright annexations. And the ruling circles in Russia were anxious not to be left out so Nicholas II himself was reported to have an unreasoning desire to seize Far Eastern lands. And the watchword in St. Petersburg was Nada Vziat, we must take. In the winter of 1897 to 8, our fourth turning point, the old avuncular posture was abandoned for good, as the Tsarist naval squadron was dispatched without any attempt to consult the Chinese authorities to occupy the Qing naval base of Liu Shun, Port Arthur, and the trading post of Dalian. Finance Minister Vita, at least, was appalled by this act of unparalleled perfidy, which had destroyed our traditional relations with China and destroyed them forever. But Vita was now a lonely voice. The result was a violent Chinese backlash, as Russians, along with other foreigners, fell victim to the xenophobic Boxer Rebellion. And the first outbreak of open hostilities between China and Russia since Nyarchinsk, as the Qing court threw their weight behind the Boxers, and the Russians reacted by sending their armies to seize control of the whole of Manchuria. Easily victorious, the Tsarist commanders began to lay the foundations of what some of them visualized as a yellow Russia attaching military commissars to the governments of the three Manchurian provinces on the model of the British political advisors to the Indian princely states, and even going so far as to import Sikh watchmen. 
Shrewder observers, however, set little store by these dreams of a colony, estimating, for instance, that it would take a permanent army of 130,000 to hold down the densely populated southern Manchurian province of Fengtian. And in any event, Russian hopes of retaining Manchuria were conclusively shattered by the Imperial Japanese Army in the War of 1904 to 5. Yet the Tsar and his counselors still hadn't given up their ambition to take Chinese territory. On the principle of, if you can't beat them, join them, they teamed up with their Japanese conquerors to conclude between 1907 and 1916, a series of secret treaties establishing their respective spheres of influence in the Chinese borderlands. Tsarist interests had now largely switched to detaching Mongolia and in 1915, three and a half years after the fall of the Manchu dynasty, they extracted from the new Chinese Republican government an agreement confirming the autonomy of Outer Mongolia under nominal Chinese sovereignty. All these activities made Tsarist Russia an object of particular loathing to the new generation of Chinese intellectuals who were finding their voice in the run-up to the nationalist revolution of 1911. Chinese students in Tokyo were said to fear the Tsarist empire more than any other foreign power. Well, as Russia fell apart in 1917, turning point number five, with the overthrow of the, of the Tsar and the subsequent Bolshevik takeover, the ruling circles in China jumped at the opportunity to roll back Russian dominance there. In December 1917, the warlord regime in Beijing sent troops to Harbin to disarm a contingent of pro-Bolshevik Russian guards stationed on the Chinese Eastern Railway. The first time in history that a European military unit had been compelled to submit to a Chinese armed force. The leading warlord Zhang Zuolin took over the administration of Harbin, a, a center founded by the Russians, which was now as Harper's Magazine noted with consternation, the only white city in the world ruled by yellows. In Mongolia, a minor warlord named Xu Shuzheng marched on the capital Urga and proclaimed the formal annulment of the Russian Engineer Treaty of 1915, providing for Mongol autonomy. And in the meantime, as Russia became convulsed by the civil war between reds and whites, tens of thousands of white refugees began to pour into Harbin, Shanghai, and other Chinese cities. Demoralized, and in many cases destitute, these whites excited the contempt of Chinese onlookers and were felt by Westerners to have contributed significantly to a European loss of prestige in the East. A contrasting trend was however beginning to take shape as the new Soviet Russians thwarted in their attempt to spread revolution to Central Europe, sought like their Tsarist predecessors after the Crimean War to recoup their losses in Asia. In 1920, a tiny band of Bolshevik missionaries made their way into China to help organize a fledgling Chinese Communist Party. But the immediate object in Lenin's view was to foster a bourgeois nationalist revolution directed at the Western imperial powers. Soviet envoys figured all the various warlord regimes as potential allies before settling on the Nationalist Party of Sun Yat-sen, on which the infant Communist Party were expected to piggyback in a united front. A seasoned agitator named Mikhail Baradin and a general named Vlasily Blucher were set out to micromanage respectively the Nationalist Party's political and military operations. And education for young Chinese nationalists and communists was provided in Moscow by a communist university of toilers of the East and later on by a Sun Yat-sen university. There's no doubt that this breed of Russian evangelists were filled with genuine enthusiasm for their cause. A young trainee interpreter Vera Vishnyakova recalled that she loved Beijing with all her heart 
and fell in love with the nationalist base in Guangzhou passionately and forever. Chinese workers in Russia had rallied to the Red Cause before the Chinese Communist Party was even founded. And by the end of 1920, the first Chinese journalists were arriving in Moscow in quest of what one of them called the lighthouse of the mind sea. In Moscow, young Chinese radicals found inspiration and also romance with Soviet girls, as reports filtered home of an extensive crop of little revolutionaries. Assiduously promoted by Stalin, the United Front policy soon ran into major difficulties. The bulk of the Nationalist Party, under Chiang Kai-shek's leadership from 1925, were intensely suspicious of both the Soviet Union and its CCP acolytes. While the CCP were resentful at having been pitched into an alliance with the Nationalists in the first place. Both the two Chinese parties were also aware that behind Moscow's revolutionary warmth, there still lingered strategic aspirations from Tsarist times. Generous promises made to China in the Karakhan Declaration of 1919 on the ownership of the Chinese Eastern Railway and other issues were mysteriously retract retracted the following year. And in 1921, the Soviet Red Army installed a pro-Bolshevik government in Outer Mongolia in effect detaching the region completely from Chinese control, while still paying lip service to Chinese sovereignty there. In 1927, turning point number six, as the Soviet trained nationalist forces marched north from Guangzhou to topple the wall of the regimes and unify the country, the entire revolutionary project crashed down around Stalin's ears. Nationalist troops slaughtered thousands of KCCP activists in Shanghai and Guangzhou, and their Soviet mentors were variously packed off home to Russia, imprisoned, and even shot. The CCP, for their part, complained bitterly of Soviet attempts to blame them for the Chinese disaster, and some authorities reckon they never really recovered their initial faith in the Soviet Union. Stalin, however, was unfazed by defeat. On the contrary, he doubled down on his original policy of backing the nationalists. From this point, of view, point onwards, his interest in China was overwhelmingly strategic. He was obsessed with the threat which was posed to the Soviet Union by an aggressive Japan. A threat made still greater in 1933, when the advent of Nazi Germany confronted Russia with the old nightmare prospect of a war on two fronts. He needed a relatively strong China to serve as a counterweight to the Japanese menace. And of all the political forces in China, only Chiang Kai-shek's new government in Nanjing seems to have the potential for playing that role. His constant idea was to keep the nationalists sweet. In 1929, he was obliged to fight a short war with Chinese troops in Manchuria, where a local warlord with Jiang's backing had seized control of the Soviet-managed Chinese Eastern Railway, but took, but took virtually no advantage of a very easy victory, except to secure the restoration of the status quo. In 1936, he actually intervened to save Jiang's life after the nationalist leader was kidnapped by his own officers in the celebrated Xi'an incident, and the CCP were proposing to get him handed over to them for trial and execution. And in 1937-8, when the Japanese plunged into an all-out invasion of China, Stalin's Soviet Union was the only foreign power to come to Jiang's aid, with a massive infusion of money and arms and a supply of top-quality military advisors. Stalin's idea was undoubtedly not philanthropic. He wanted to keep the Japanese army bogged down for as long as possible, at a safe distance from his own frontiers. But if it hadn't been for his intervention, it seems highly likely that the Chinese resistance to Japan would have crumbled in the first two years of the Sino-Japanese War. Stalin's strategic preoccupation remained much the same after 1943, when the United States replaced Japan in his mind as the chief external threat to Soviet interests. In 
At a meeting with Chiang Kai-shek's son, Jiang Jingguo, in December 1945, he offered the nationalist regime a close partnership combined with economic help in developing Xinjiang and Manchuria. His only condition was that not a single American soldier should be allowed to remain on Chinese soil. Right through all these years, the Chinese communists were aggrieved to find themselves left perpetually on the back burner. In the late 1930s, as the nationalists took delivery of copious quantities of Soviet military aid, Russian supplies to the CCP in Yan'an are said to have consisted merely of copies of Pravda and the speeches and writings of Lenin and Stalin, a discrepancy summed up by the CCP activists as books to the proletariat, arms to the bourgeoisie. Mao Zedong is said to have sworn and stamped his feet in fury in 1936 after the Xi'an kidnapping, when Stalin's cable arrived, directing him not to press for Jiang's death. And in August 1945, when the Soviet leader ordered him to proceed to Chongqing for peace talks with Jiang, he apparently was so angry he didn't go out for two days. In 1949, turning point seven, following the CCP's victory in the Chinese Civil War, Russia found itself suddenly on the ultimate inside track with Beijing. Soviet airmen protected the skies of the new People's China, and Soviet naval experts were sent to help, to help China create a modern fleet. Soviet political advisors were installed in every department of the new Chinese government, both central and re regional and Soviet scientists and engineers moved in to lay the foundations of what's been described as the biggest technology transfer in history. But the much vaunted Sino-Soviet honeymoon was, went sour in many respects from the very first days. In an unhappy visit to Moscow, a mere three months after the establishment of his rule, Mao was obliged by Stalin to accept a new Sino-Soviet treaty providing the Russians with certain benefits of an eerily colonial kind. Joint ventures were set up in Xinjiang and Manchuria, giving the Soviet Union access to huge amounts of petroleum and other minerals, and the right to take part in civil aviation and shipbuilding projects. Stalin's financial aid for Beijing took the form of a loan, not a grant, and a loan for the somewhat miserly sum of 300 million US dollars. In the Korean War of 1950 to 53, Russia and China combined for the first time in a joint military campaign beyond their borders. But the Chinese were expected to provide the manpower and to pay for the tanks and aircraft the Russians supplied, which weren't always the most advanced at the Kremlin's disposal. After Stalin's death in 1953, the CCP started to kick up the traces. Some Chinese leaders began to claim that Mao and not Stalin's successor Khrushchev was the rightful head of the international communist movement. Khrushchev took vigorous action to increase the volume of aid to Beijing and to remove the worst irritants, but was still unable to win Mao's respect. By 1955, Khrushchev and his colleagues were sufficiently alarmed by the state of their relations with China to confine their anxieties to Western European leaders such as Harold Macmillan and Conrad Adenauer. In contrast with these growing tensions, the grassroots relationships between Soviet technicians and their Chinese pupils appear to have been consistently warm. Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin in 1956, turning at point number eight, led to a major shift in the whole dynamics of Sino-Russian interaction. Ever since the 1850s, it had been the Russians, whether Tsarist or Soviet, who'd set the pace of the relationship, with the Chinese reacting either positively or negatively, as the case might be. From this point on, it was the Chinese who were making the running, with the Russians increasingly passive and on the defensive. The point was that with Khrushchev's speech, the Soviet Union was no longer a monolith, its teachings were no longer infallible, and Mao could enjoy the satisfaction of sitting in judgment on its rival leaders. The chairman began the great Chinese counter-offensive 
with a series of rhetorical jabs, sending Zhou Enlai to Moscow in January 1957 to give Khrushchev and his associates a good dressing down for their U-turn about Stalin and their great, great power arrogance, which had led to the recent upheavals in Poland and Hungary. And as an international communist gathering the following November, seeking to paint the Russians as wimps who were frightened of nuclear war. The next Chinese move was the gigantic experiment of the Great Leap Forward and the People's Communes, projects calculated to outstrip the Soviets, both economically and politically. Though perhaps Mao conceded graciously, China should allow the Soviet Union to make the breakthrough of communism first, to give the Russians a bit of face. From 1960 onwards, the Chinese public publicly took up the cudgels against the Russians in the great ideological ding-dong. Deng Xiaoping, who played a leading role in these public polemics, admitted years later that there had been a great deal of hot air on both sides, and that the core grievance of the Chinese had been nationalistic, the failure of the Soviet Union to treat them as equals. However, the fact that both the Russians and the the CCP had embraced the secular religion, religion of Marxism-Leninism, lent any disagreements an additional venom. At the same time, the Chinese were also beginning to rake up the long-standing territorial conflicts along the borders of Xinjiang and Manchuria, with numerous border scuffles and Mao even threatening to present the bill for outer Manchuria the huge region snaffled by Tsarist Russia in 1860. By 1969, the now bitter hostility between the two powers had reached a whole new level of intensity, with Mao authorizing an all-out attack on Soviet border troops patrolling the disputed island of Junbao, otherwise known as Domansky Island, in the Usuri River, and a further incursion a few months later from Xinjiang in the neighborhood of the Russian border settlements of Jalanaskol. Once again, the two countries stared into the abyss. The Soviet defense minister, Andrei Gretschko, urged a surgical strike against Chinese nuclear installations. And secret overtures were made to the United States to establish whether the weight of the White House would acquiesce in such a move. And on the Chinese side, Mao is said to have given instructions for the testing of a couple of hydrogen bombs in Xinjiang. Once again, however, moderation prevailed. The Brezhnev leadership in Moscow settled for a containment strategy towards China, not unlike that pursued by the US vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union in the 1950s. Mao was apparently dissuaded from his potentially suicidal H-bomb tests and instead sought security through China's emerging partnership with the United States. For the next 10 years, the two enemies remained frozen behind their massive accumulation of weapons and troops. The Chinese continued to set the course for the relationship, routinely turning down the half-hearted proposals for new diplomatic departures, which the Soviet leaders tabled, seeking hope, as one of them put it, in the dead of night. Deng Xiaoping maintained Mao's stony attitude to the Kremlin with the significant difference that while Mao took delight in revolutionary chaos, Deng sought a peaceful international environment for China's modernization. Beginning in 1979, the two neighbors began to edge back towards each other by fits and starts. But Deng kept control of the process, prepared to move towards normalizing relations, only when the Russians had taken significant steps to dismantle what he called the three great obstacles. Soviet backing for Vietnam's occupation of, Cam of Cambodia, the Soviet military presence in Afghanistan, and the Soviet military buildup along China's northern border. And it was only when Moscow gave way, when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power and work was finally begun on removing the obstacles, that Deng judged enough progress had been made to warrant a summit of reconciliation. With Gorbachev's visit to Beijing, in May 1989, our ninth turning point, the old Sino-Soviet partnership seems to have been triumphantly reborn. The relationships between the two states and communist parties have been restored on a basis of strict equality 
and Deng Xiaoping announced that the time had come to close the past and open the future. But the past wasn't to be wished away quite so easily. Deng himself continued to harp at considerable length on the past Russian seizure of Chinese territory, and in particular on the Soviet detachment of Outer Mongolia from Chinese rule, leading Gorbachev to confide to an aide that he was fed up with this old man's sermons. And at this very juncture, the CCP found themselves having to contend with the student demonstrations in Tiananmen Square, with the students hailing Gorbachev as their inspiration in the last great show of Chinese enthusiasm for Russia in the 20th century. From Deng's point of view, the Soviet leader was an idiot for having embarked on economic reform without at the same time keeping the political lid on. In November 1989, Premier Li Peng declared ominously that it was only the relations between states, not parties, that had been normalized. By 1990, internal CCP documents were condemning Gorbachev as a traitor to the socialist cause, and the stage seemed set for a return to the ideolo ideological mayhem of the 1960s. This short two-year period was nonetheless marked by a genuine and profound shift in the economic field. Following Gorbachev's visit, members of the Soviet leadership began to astonish their CCP counterparts by requesting Chinese economic aid and loans to help their country weather the mounting disasters of Perestroika. In 1990, the New York Times judged the economic output of the Soviet Union and China to be roughly equal. And it may be this period marks the critical moment at which the Chinese caught up. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 forms our 10th and last turning point. After just one year of initial wariness between the new post-communist Russia and the post-1989 China, Sino-Russian relations settled into a harmonious pattern which they've retained ever since. The relationship indeed seemed vastly better with the absence of a shared ideology. This growing harmony was labeled as a series of ascending stages from friendly countries to a constructive partnership, a strategic partnership, and finally, a comprehensive strategic partnership. Leaders of the two countries paid incessant visits to each other, proclaiming that the relationship had entered, entered its best period ever, had risen to unparalleled heights, had attained a uniquely high level of mutual trust. By the early 2020s, this sunny period had lasted three times as long as the doomed Sino-Soviet honeymoon of 70 years before. Unlike the failed honeymoon, it wasn't a revolutionary alliance, but a deeply conservative alignment. Two powers joining forces to uphold the traditional concepts laid down in the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, of the sanctity of nation states and their right to do what they pleased within their own borders against the view held increasingly by the United States and the West, that national rulers are answerable for their internal behavior to a higher global tribunal. This shared conviction was underpinned by a common distaste for current Western social and moral values. As the years passed, the two powers built camps around them with a view to replacing the US dominated unipolar order with a multipolar world through the creation of such bodies as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, corralling the new Central Asian states, and the BRICS coalition, including the leading global South countries of Brazil, India, and South Africa. All this has involved a return to the old equilibrium which typified the relations between China and Russia from the late 17th to the mid 19th centuries. But can this equilibrium last? This seems to me to entail a short-term question and a long-term question. The short-term question relates to President Putin's attempts to bolster his country's security by invading his neighbors, conduct incidentally in flagrant breach of the Treaty of Westphalia. I propose to throw this open for discussion in the question and answer session. The longer-term question is whether an equilibrium can actually be maintained 
as China races economically farther and farther ahead of its northern neighbor, with a GDP up to 10 times as larger than that of the Russian Federation, and the Russian GDP outstripped by that of Guangdong province alone. Arms supplier to successive Chinese regimes for many generations, Russia now shows signs of turning to China for high-tech military supplies, ranging from drones and surface-to-air missiles the vital spare parts for advanced weapon systems. Questions sometimes discussed are how long Russia will be content to serve as a resource appendage of China, meeting the PRC's ever-growing need for oil and gas, and whether under the impact of climate change, conflict could arise, for example, over Chinese attempts to get access to the huge water supplies of Lake Baikal. All of this relates closely to the huge demographic disparity, 6 million people in the Russian Far East facing 110 million people in China's northeastern provinces. Chinese migration across the Amur has been a source of alarm in Russia ever since the late 19th century. And while some of the worst fears were dispelled with the issue of Russian government statistics showing that the number of permanent Chinese residents in the country, as opposed to transient traders and laborers, was actually quite small. Recent reports of Westerners visiting the Russian border cities suggest that there, at least, the old nightmare still lingers. Finally, there's been speculation of possible friction between the two powers in the former Soviet Central Asia, a region into which Chinese influence has been penetrating for the first time since the mid 18th century. Up till now, China and Russia seem to have made a rather comfortable division of labor, with Russia continuing to dominate in the political and military spheres, Russian troops, for example, um, descending into Kazakhstan during the outbreak of unrest there in January 2022, with the, while the, with the Chinese concentrating their efforts on the economic side. But China has also shown occasional signs of crossing that boundary, sending troops and military instructors to Tajikistan, for example, to help prevent an influx of Islamic extremism from Afghanistan into Xinjiang. Russia wasn't consulted about this, and the Kremlin is said to have been rattled. These are all, however, long-term problems, likely to cause difficulty some decades from now, unlikely to rock the Sino-Russian boat in the immediate future. Considerable trouble has been taken by both leaderships in the short term, to ensure that the dreadful breakdown of relations in the 1950s and 1960s doesn't happen again. One sign of this effort has been visible in the cultural field. Whereas the pattern in the 1950s was one of acrimony at the highest levels of government, warmth and harmony at the grassroots, the pattern since the 1990s has been precisely the opposite. The political leaders have hugged each other but at the grassroots level, ordinary Russians have ceased to view China as a backward neighbor requiring their aid, while ordinary Chinese no longer believe that Russia has anything from which they can learn. Officials on both sides have acknowledged that the relationship is warm on the outside, but cold within. I like to call it a baked Alaska relationship. <laughs> Since 2006, the official answer has been to set up a long lavish series of years of Russia in China and years of China in Russia, reintroducing their peoples to the other side's arts, music, cultural treasures, language, tourist sites, media, and so forth. Whether these efforts have had any impact, I don't know, but some narrowing of the cultural gap must surely be an important precondition for harmony both in the short and long term. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention.